Thanks, Chris. Um, I think I'll just stay over here if that's okay. Um, so uh, Chris asked me to give you all this uh, announcement, as he said, kind of a, a grand announcement prior to us really uh, doing this uh, formally. Uh, so H2M hears it first. Um, talk a little bit about uh, what he, he, as he laid it out to me, he said, so I want you to give this real short little talk, kind of like a TED talk kind of thing. Uh, and explain to the people what we're doing. So I said, okay, and it's kind of a concept we have, so it's not fully baked yet. Um, so in a way, I was thinking about it last night, and I said, this is kind of like going on Shark Tank. You know, I'm trying to go up here and get these people excited about maybe putting some money into something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of combine like a TED Talk kind of approach and a Shark Tank uh, pitch to you all. <laughs> uh, so bear with me a little. Um, this is Exolance, uh, and what we started out with, as, as you've heard you know, throughout this, and Chris was just talking about our Fording Mars workshop, we tend to bring together a lot of different communities uh, within Explore Mars, and I've been privileged as uh, being part of Explore Mars uh, to get to meet people, you know, who, some of which uh, I, I can remember back in 1986 going to the, the Mars conference here in D.C. Uh, as a young engineer at that time, uh, and meeting or hearing, uh, among others, uh, Gil Levin uh, talk about the uh, Cairo release experiment on Viking and argue you know, passionately that he believed that Viking actually did find life on Mars. And so he's one of the people that's been involved with us in this project. We have people from the science side. Um, being part of a company like Aerojet Rocketdyne, I'm lucky in that I get to see a lot of different things that we do in the company. And one of the things that became interesting as part of this project is something we do in our armaments division, which is uh, figuring out how to put things many meters down under the ground. Um, usually these aren't things that are going to search for life that we're working on here on Earth, um, but the technology to do uh, penetration on Mars is the same as it is for penetrating bunkers here on Earth. So that's what I'm going to launch into here, give you a little description about what we've come <coughs> up with, and it's something we call Exolance. Uh, the, the goal is to come up with a way to investigate life on Mars, and you see the word affordable in there. Um, it's important, we think, to be able to do this repeatably, sustainably, and affordably. We can't afford in terms of a big cost on the project, and you'll see some of the some of the design challenges that we think we've addressed in that way. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, is he one You're back the there? Clicker. <laughs> I, I guess I have a clicker. There we go. Oops, I rang a bell. Let's try the other way. There we go. So our mission, or the goal of this, was to take advantage of a lot of the uh, planned missions that are uh, going to Mars in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, we now have a whole lot of, uh, of new concepts, like we saw on MSL with the sky crane. Um, other landers are planned. Uh, anything where you're going in through EDL, um, you're entering the atmosphere, you have a transitional phase where you're still moving rather fast. The goal of this was to figure out something we could put on as a ride-along. Uh, you're all familiar with secondary payloads now. It's becoming a really big buzzword in the Earth orbital arena to get experiments flown. Uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges to any kind of science experiment is getting a ride. So what we're looking at is coming up with something here where we have these things ride along in what we call a quiver. Uh, this is a, think of this like a bunch of arrows. Uh, I, I won't say we were, uh, we were uh, completely inspired by the, uh, the recent uh, popularity of archery coming about because of the movies and things like that, but, but it was in the back of our minds. Um, so we want these things to be rather small, lightweight. Uh, they're not going to be a big burden in terms of power uh, on the mission. They're going to be easily integratable. Um, the penetrator, as I mentioned earlier, is based on bunker buster technology. It's something we know how to do very well. Um, the science comes along. Uh, we give them a volume. They can define their experiment. Um, and the idea, the concept is we deploy it during the final phase of EDL. It's passive. It doesn't have any propulsion of its own. You know, again, our goal is to make it very simple. 
We just take advantage of that kinetic energy that we've got when we pop off of the, the main craft and we go bury ourselves into Mars. So here's a little uh, uh, quick scenario I'm just going to walk you through. So you can see the, uh, the vehicle now entering the Mars atmosphere, the outer reaches with the Explore Mars logo on there. Uh, we assume we'll pop out a parachute, slow down a little bit uh, to uh, several hundred kilometers uh, per second. Uh, we'll jettison. This is a sky crane type approach we're showing here. And at that point, we begin to pop off the exolances. Um, so the second part of this that's interesting uh, is we went back and we looked at some of the previous uh, penetrator type proposals that had been done. And some of you may remember under the new Millennium Program something called Deep Space Two. Um, so Deep Space Two had a really good innovative concept, we think, and that is when you actually impact the surface and you have your penetrator, you want that to bury itself very deeply, at least a couple of meters, because that's the region, and then we're getting back to the search for life, everyone agrees that if there is extant life on Mars, it's probably down many meters below the surface, or at least a meter or more below the surface, because of all the things you've heard here at the conference that um, are bad for life right on the surface. So we want to bury this thing pretty deep. At the same time, we've got to be able to communicate with overhead assets to relay the data, the telemetry, back to Earth. So the idea that Deep Space 2 had, that we're borrowing, is the idea that we separate upon impact. And the penetrator section with the payload goes down, buries itself deeply in Mars. The aft section gets uh, stops at basic. We have fins and supports that can act as a stop on the surface, and that's where the comm payload is. So that's the part that's really going to take the high G loads. The rest of it's going to bury itself down. It's going to take a pretty good G load, but we're, we're still working those details. But you can see the concept up here on the screen. And basically, the science payload that we're talking about right now with Gill is this metabolic test that distinguishes non-living organic chemistry from the chemistry of, or non-organic chemistry from the chemistry of living microorganisms. Um, so we're looking at, again, as I said, one to two meters below surface, uh, having a science payload that rides down with the penetrator, um, and having multiple probes that could go on each one of these opportunities. So not only do you have uh, redundancy there and reliability that comes with redundancy, because if one probe crashes and hits at us too shallow an angle or hits a rock, we lose that probe, but we don't lose the whole mission. Uh, the other thing you get is you get a distribution across uh, a little bit wider range. If you're coming in, you know, and you're pretty high still when you're dropping them off, you can, you can stagger the drop off so that you get a a pretty good dis distribution across the surface of Mars over you know, maybe many kilometers. So that's our concept um, and the science that we've got. And we really hope that we can get people excited about it and get some other good ideas to come in as well. Because at this point, we're just, we're just really conceptualizing for uh, a, a quick, affordable way to take advantage of other missions and put some uh, Mars science missions out there that can search for life. Thank you. So any questions? Uh, more of a comment. Um, on the Curiosity landing, uh, it's my understanding that they actually had to eject ballast on the way down to change right. the CG between right. the aero entry and, uh, and beyond. So you may actually want to look at right. uh, replacing the ballast that they uh -huh. had done. And <laughs> Excellent. Obviously, right. Mars yeah. 2020 is going to follow yeah. the same pathway. So Thank you. That's a that was my question and point also. And we're talking hundreds of kilograms. OK. And I didn't mention it, but each one of these individual exolants right now, the way we've got them conceived, is only about uh, four to five pounds. And of course, you have a quiver structure and things like that. But it sounds like we could put a lot on there. <laughs> yeah. I, I should also note that kind of our goal this year is to raise funds to be able to build and test uh, these penetrators this year or into next year. It's not going to cost a lot of money. It'll probably, what, cost less than half a million dollars yeah. to actually build and test in the Mojave Desert these penetrator probes. So we're hoping to be able to raise these funds. And this, this is something we can do fairly quickly, fairly inexpensively, and have results to see, prove out the technology, the concept, 
you know, within a year if we can, if we get the funding. So this isn't something that's going to take multiple years and millions of dollars to prove out. So this is where we'd love to hear your, in, your, your input and if there are people you know who might be interested in helping, you know, in kind or with funds or anything else, because we can do this pretty quickly, so. Uh, Michael Thompson from Philadelphia. That sounds great. Um, I'm just curious about what kind of science instruments you'd have in the payload, uh, if you have those developed already, and uh, what considerations you would uh, have for choosing them. Okay. So, so we have one concept right now that we've been working with, with um, a couple of folks that are somewhat affiliated with us, uh, and uh, I don't know, we said Chris McKay. Yeah who's part of our board of advisors, has been one of the folks working with us on the science side, and then Gil Levin at uh, Arizona State, right? He goes at uh, Arizona State. Yeah. Um, so we had a sort of a definition, and, and really what we were doing there was we were just taking something, a point design that they had and saying, can we make that work within the volume and you know, the other constraints that we have with something small like this? And we, we thought that we had, a, you know, we closed on that. but. That's not to say, and I think the, the I'll say uh, and ask Chris to, to confirm, we would be welcoming anybody's ideas uh, for, you know, assuming we give you uh, an interface, um, you're going to have to survive so many Gs, you're going to have to fit within a cylinder that's, you know, so many uh, centimeters long by so many centimeters in diameter, um, and other things like that. And obviously, you know, we're going to put you in the bottom of a hole. Uh, so, <laughs> how you get things that you want to uh, that you want to uh, look at in contact with your sensors is up to you. But so you know, we'll we'll sort of define that for you, and then we'd welcome any any potential payloads. I think. Yeah, absolutely. We welcome that input. You know, we don't claim to have all the answers. We want to start developing it. it well, you know, if we come out, our initial concept may not be viable, but we want to make sure if we're going to do it, we want to be successful. So we right. certainly welcome your input on the science payload or the delivery system. So. Yeah, yeah tra Travis Robinson of JSC. The, the uh, oil and gas industry has, for many, many years, worked in a very difficult environment down in Under the, the sea, yeah. Looking for porosity primarily was the primary, and then, of course, they want to determine whether it's gas or salt water, but they've got a lot of instrumentation, a lot of things that are very, very, very robust measurement while drilling kind of things. So there may be some technology out there that, that uh, may be applicable to this particular application. I, I don't know, but I, I suspect that there may be. Great. Thank you. That's a great suggestion, too. Yeah. An another um, concept. You write that, that down, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Keep that in your head, okay. Another idea, we've kind of heard a lot of people talking about how these penetrators can be used for other purposes as well. So this is something else we're interested in. You know, obviously we want to get this to Mars and use it for that purpose, but we've heard a number of ideas of how we could use this on other space missions here on Earth as well. You know, there might be other applications, so that's other by the way, we use it here on Earth already. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, other than warfare, <laughs> you know, uh, other than warfare, other applications, you know, if you can get a science uh, right. package below the surface, places where it might be easier than sending people, you know, I, like I heard, I can't remember who asked me when I was out in Silicon Valley, you know, there might be ways, you know, of looking for subsurface water, how, you know, the water level, things like that, where they usually now have to send people, where, but if you could actually drop them, you know, you, with sensors, you'd be able to get that data, you know, much more efficiently. So we're also looking for those sorts of applications that could be used here on Earth, but also other applications in space as well. Um, you mentioned uh, the G-forces and other uh, criteria that they would have to build their equipment to withstand. Right. Um, others, aside from the delivery technology, are you working on any technology to mitigate that and make it a wider range of, of uh, experiments that could go? Sure. Um, we have some thoughts about that. Um, as Chris says, right now we're still just going through the conceptual design process. I think our plan right now is put together a prototype, take it out to New Mexico, uh, fire it out of the gun, um, measure, you know, in a representative uh, cylinder what kind of forces we're seeing, and then make some determinations about whether we have to put some shock uh, reduction uh, damping in there. Um, and that's, so yeah, there are some ideas that our guys have. Usually the, the stuff that we do this for, we don't have to worry too much about. 
uh, other than the electronics. Okay, so any other questions? Or? I just came to thank uh, H2M and Aerojet Rocketdyne for sponsoring STEM education and the NASA Exploration Design Challenge. We actually are the team from California. Oh, oh great, yeah. welcome. Great, good welcome. for you. Thank you for Would you like to all stand up, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. stand up. Right. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Oops. Yes. Hi, Steve Brody from ISU. Uh, I just want to make sure I came in late, so if this has already been mentioned, but uh, there is uh, some experience you might want to tap from NASA Ames, the L Cross mission, right. which was, uh, I believe, a probe to the moon, you know, to do something, you know, as a tag along on uh, LRO or something like that. So. Yeah, and, and as we said, Chris McKay is at Ames, yep. so right. And, and we have had some discussions at Ames with other folks as well, so we definitely want to follow up on that. Yeah. So thanks. Great. Any other questions? Well, if not, well, thank you very much.